Okay, here's part three of the CART lecture, and this is where I'm just going to walk through real quick on the computer. Um, so um, first, just let me uh, make a real, uh, just recreate that uh, tree that we used in the slides. So um, first, I'm going to load in the salary data, the tidyverse, and then there are two packages, rpart and rpart.plot. rpart makes the trees, rpart makes the trees uh, pretty. So um, here I'm going to take the salary data and I'm going to do those couple uh, changes we made where we only selected a couple variables and we divided salary by a thousand. Um, so I'm going to do the regression model. Actually, I don't even have to do that. Um, but if I did, there's the commands and those look pretty familiar. And again, that standard deviation um, of the model. Oops, Sal. That was our starting RMSE for that. Um, anyway, um, our part is the command that we use to make uh, partition trees or cart trees. And what you can see is it looks almost exactly like uh, what we did for regression. You put what you want to predict tilde and then the other variables. I'm going to do the period because I want all the variables because I already limited the data set to the variables we want. And when you run it, you can see it runs super quick. Now, um, the plot um, looks out uh, like this. And here, let me make it bigger so that we can see it. Um, but the plot looks like this. Um, you can see that it's not super pretty. There's actually a ton of options that you can go in uh, to change it, but as you go in, each uh, decision point just gives you a yes and a no. Then on each side, it gives you uh, the value of the prediction. So again, after that first slice, it was 88,000 versus $123,000. And the number of, uh, or the percent of the data that falls in that box. So 27% of the professors were over here and 73 were over here then each split uh, does it like that. Uh, I'm going to close that for a second because one of the things that's cool about our part dot plot is it has a million options. And I actually go over here to the help screen to look at all of them all the time. The one that I like to use is type equals five. And you can do it however you'd like, but type equals five has made the same plot, but now um, it looks like this, and actually the text is still too small. So the other one there is uh, tweak. And tweak makes the letters twice as big. And let's see how that looks. So now um, you can see it's a little bit funky how it displays it. But the idea is, um, yeah, let's make it a little bit smaller. Make tweak equal. Um, Maybe you can see what that looks like. Um, there we go. Oops. And there's our graph. And let's see. Okay, so now we can see it pretty well. Um, so year since PhD, less than 13. It does round them to one decimal point, which is funny. Um, and then greater than 43. That's okay. That's weird. That's behind there. Um, and from there, you can see all the different ports. Again, the uh, tree that was in the slides was made with our studio, so it just takes a little bit of time to fiddle with the options. Um, the other thing to notice is, see how it's colored on the bottom? Dark is a higher number and white is a lower number. So as we move along here, you can see that we generally get from less uh, salary to more salary as we do that. And again, we could fiddle with the graph um, a lot in order to uh, figure that out. And the last thing I want to do is just show you what the output of um, an R part function is because it's kind of super gigantic. And normally we wouldn't uh, look at all of these things here, but let's uh, do it this time because again, this is a nice small uh, model. So um, it gives you this measure called variable importance, which is how much each of those variables are used. Remember, year since PhD was more important. So the first node, which is that first split up here, um, it shows it as 397 observations. That's the same as our data set, so that's everybody. And it gives you the MSE um, 
for that split. Again, this isn't the raw MSE like we were looking at before. Um, it's a kind of, uh, oh, I know why, because it's not square rooted. That's why it's not RMSE, it's MSE. Anyway, um, you can see here are primary splits at um, either 12 and a half or eight and a half. And it uses 12 and a half because that's the first split. It also calculates surrogates, which is what it, what it uses when our data is missing a value. So surrogates are actually nice because you don't want it to crash. You want it to do the best that it can. Then over here will be node two, and you can see here what it's doing. And again, here it gives you the splits of eight and a half or six and a half, and it goes with eight and a half because that improves your uh, MSE by more, right? And again, this is MSE, not RMSE, which is sort of funny. So one, two, three, and here's our next node, and so on and so forth. Notice nodes four, five, and six don't split. So four, five, uh, all the way down. Node seven now does have that split, and it uses 21 and a half, which is this one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it goes eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, just like you would think um, counting down a tree. Again, it gives you way more information than you can actually use, but having that information can sometimes be useful. And again, you can see how um, each of these subgroups has actually a pretty good MSE, right, because it's calculating it for each of those subgroups separately. So again, this node 63, which is this one here at the very bottom, uh, it actually has a pretty low uh, MSE as well. Um, node 56 actually has an even better one here. Which one is that? That's the one with the mean of 104. So those are those uh, uh, folks who were kind of in that middle uh, category. So anyway, that is how RMSE uh, can be read. Again, the tree itself is nice to look at. It has some good uh, features to it. I now want to go to Ames Housing, which is a little bit more complicated data set. But I think uh, you'll kind of see how it's more interesting, and I do uh, do that. All right, so let me set up the data. Um, again, um, I'm doing some data cleaning here to get rid of some of the variables and keep some of the others, kind of like a cooking show I have it set up. The other thing I'm going to do, like I showed in that uh, other video, is we're splitting into a test and a training set to do that. All right, so um, I'm going to make the tree here um, pretty quickly. Um, just looking at our data set, remember we have uh, 3,000 data points total. The training set has uh, about 1,900 points in it. I also put in this option max surrogate. Because the data is complete, I'm not going to use those surrogates. It makes it run even a little bit faster. And you can see even with that big of a data set, the tree runs almost instantly. Here is the tree that it makes. Notice that it's teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, the words um, some of that is because we're using categorical variables. So what it's saying is overall quality equals poor, fair, below average, average, above average, or good. So that's a split, but now um, it has to list all those categories. So here I'm going to add in several of the options. Again, type equals five, CEX, which is like tweak to change the size. I'm also going to change the box palette. So that's going to be the color at the, that we use. And then I'm also going to add a shadow just because I want to be kind of cool looking. All right, well now this should be a little bit easier to see. And what we can see is overall quality is the uh, first uh, split. So if the overall quality is good or lower, so that's one, two, three, four, five on the scale, um, <clears throat> then it goes the one direction. If it's very good, excellent, or very excellent, it goes the other direction. And that's gonna be, again, a prediction of how much the house sells for. Then overall quality is used again. So again, the second split works. So now good is pulled off from these other ones. And over here, good, very good is pulled off from excellent and very excellent. Down here, we then look at general living area. Remember, that's the size of the house. So if your house is less than 1,200 square feet versus bigger than 1,200 square feet, that's these houses that don't have a very good quality. Then total basement and square footage is used for the very cheap houses. And you can see 10% of houses fall into this category and they sold for an average of $100,000. Again, less than 1,250 square feet, less than 800 in the basement, and then 1,250 uh, general living, and then a large basement. The large basement changed the mean from 100,000 to 133. 
right? That's different than the regression model, but it still gives us these nice distinguishing characteristics. For the houses that were larger, now the garage becomes important. So if the house wasn't very good, but it was a bigger house with a big garage, it now sells for $177,000, which is a big jump. Um, and again, it's not the necessarily the size of your garage is what's important, but that often goes along with a lot of other characteristics, right? It's doing that naive split, so we can't really dig in. Now here, houses that had a quality of good, all that matters here for this split was the general living area. So smaller houses, 1,400 square feet or less, sold for 177, about the same as the large houses over here. And the large houses here sold for 219,000. So that's a pretty big jump. But again, we know that living area is important the size of the house, right? Over here, very good separates from excellent, again, large and small, and for excellent, very excellent, large and small. Again, a 3,000 square foot house is pretty big. That's normally a five or six bedroom house, 2250 and smaller than 2250. You can see that an excellent house, even if it's sort of small, although again, 2250 every house, or I'm sorry, that's where the split is. Now these houses are selling 300, 400, 600,000 dollars. Notice that this says 0%, so again, it's less than 1%, but or less than a half percent, I guess, but out of 2,000 data points, that still could be, um, what, 10 or 10 houses or so. So you can see how this CART model gives us a nice sort of display, very different from the regression model, but um, one that can actually be useful, and this idea that we can see which variables are important. I'm going to do the summary of this model but again, it's gonna be gigantic. But let's just pop up here to the top. Oops. Let's pop up here to the top and we can see which variables turn out to be important. Overall quality, general living area, garage, and the size of the basements. So here are our splits. Um, and you can see all this information going down. You can see how MSE, not RMSE, uh, is used to do that. And again, you can see all these different splits and how it works. Okay, so um, that is sort of a good example of um, how a cart tree goes. Here's one last example. Um, and this is the one that is the uh, Kim data set. And um, again, we're going to split that. And here we go. First of all, here's our simple table. Notice this is exactly the chart. Well, I guess it's not exactly because I'm looking at the subset of data, but this is that naive base split that we looked at. And you remember 68 inches was where the split was. And even on this subset, you can see that right here is where there's more female than male. And now there's more males than females. So we can do this model. This time I left all the variables in. And if we make this plot, we can now zoom in on it. The plot looks a little bit different because of what we're doing here. Um, let me make the, uh, letters a little bit bigger here, and now we'll go back to the chart. And so now you can see that now shoe size is actually our first distinguishing characteristic. And so um, those that have a shoe size greater than 9.8 I'm sorry, less than 9.8, yes, go this way. Those that are no, go this way. And here you can see that there are blue uh, for female and green for male. And here, 84% of this uh, category are female and 16% are male. In this category, it's 86% and 14. So that one split by shoe size actually works pretty well. Here, shoe size is used as a second split. So if your shoe size is eight or less, now 94 four percent of uh, respondents go there. Our one person who didn't have uh, identify a gender also goes here. Notice there's only one, so they never get a color of their own. Uh, it uses orange for a third color by the default. Anyway, over here on this side, now height is the distinguishing uh, factor, and you can see 95 percent is correct here. For those that have a shoe size of exactly nine, because again, it's less than 9.8 and big, I guess it could be a eight and a half or a nine and a half. Now height is gonna be the characteristic. Here, oddly, servings of fruit is the best characteristic. So apparently, if you eat more than 1.3 servings of fruit, you're predicted to be female. If you eat less fruit, you're predicted to be male. 
I don't know, that's the fun of data-driven decision-making. Over here, it's how much water you drink. And again, if you drink less water, it predicts that you're female. And more water, it predicts that you're male. So that kind of gives you just a sense of how we can use these. One last aside, and then we'll be done, is to talk about dinosaurs. So classification trees are not new. Um, they've been around for hundreds of years. Uh, Linnaeus, who uh, first came up with the idea of species, had one in 1738. Uh, Darrow made one for his encyclopedia in 1752. Darwin used one in Origin of Species. And um, this idea is, like I said, just not a new one. So anyway, let's talk about dinosaurs. So you all know that pterodactyls are cool. And if you're not a nerd, you would say the pterodactyls are one of the coolest kinds of dinosaurs. But if you're awesome, you would know that pterodactyls are not dinosaurs at all. Depending where you are in the nerd scale, you know, I don't know if you know that or not. And it could even be that maybe 10 year old you remembered that, but 20 something you doesn't remember that. Um, anyway, we know they're both lizards. And so one question you might wonder is what's the clade, what's the category that includes both of those? So modern DNA, I'm sorry, modern trees use DNA, but old ones use physical characteristics. So here you go. And if you look, what you can see is this broader category are called archosaurs. And archosaurs include everything from crocodiles, pterosaurs, all the dinosaurs, and birds. Turtles aren't there, or snakes, and some of the other kinds of lizard uh, newts and things like that. Um, but you can see crocodiles and crocodile relatives. I guess that's alligators, um, depending on whether they say see you later or after a while. Then you can see that uh, this lame label here, or ornithodians, oh, ornithodians, includes pterosaurs and the others, which we call dinosaurs. And you can see dinosaurs break up into two groups. This distance has to do with uh, how many uh, millions of years the evolution took. Um, these ones are the ones we tend to think of as nice in a dinosaur movie, and these ones are less nice, although brontosauruses are there. And then theropods, which include both tyrannosauruses, which eat you in the dinosaur movie, and birds, which you eat at Thanksgiving. Um, anyway, we still use those charts today, but we now use DNA evidence for that. Um, the physical characteristics, the size of the bones, you can see here are these two kinds of bones, um, and that's what splits the dinosaurs. Um, it's sort of interesting that birds are not in the category that are called bird-hipped uh, dinosaurs. I don't know, you can check that out on your own. Anyway, my last thing is to talk about is carnivora. Carnivora is perhaps your favorite tree, your favorite branch of mammals. It includes dogs and cats and other things that are like that. So one example is bears. So bears have always been included in carnivora, but it wasn't really clear until DNA evidence came whether or not bears were more like cats or more like dogs. We know that the splits are always pairwise, so there's always two, so it has to be closer to one than the other. There's never a three-way split. Anyway, if your Google uh, turns on and you look at a carnivora tree, what you would see is that bears come out to be clearly in the uh, dog side and not the cat side. And here are bears, here are dogs. What's maybe more interesting is that seals, walruses, and those sorts of things come out closer to uh, raccoons and pandas than they are, than raccoons and pandas are closer to those than they are to dogs. Up here in cats, you probably aren't surprised uh, that, you know, lions and stuff are related to cats. Um, hyenas are actually related to cats and not to dogs and all those kind of things. Anyway, this idea classification tree isn't new and it isn't limited just to kind of modern data. You can also do it with uh, other sorts of things, although it is actually true that when they do the DNA analysis, they actually use a form of cart to do those analysis. It's the same logic, even though it's sort of a totally um, different thing. Anyway, that's cart trees.